Past and present is the title of this year's edition of Global Access. Is it possible to draw conclusions from past events? Or is man doomed to repeat the mistakes of yesterday? How do authoritarian regimes use their own country's history to secure power? And what role does the individual play? In these interviews, researchers, journalists and writers try to answer these questions. In the late 1980s, it seemed that liberal market democracy had outperformed all other social systems. But since the financial crisis in 2008, capitalism is once again in a defensive position. If the liberal market economy is to survive, it must be combined with sound public finances, functioning institutions and a strong civil society. Neil Ferguson explains in conversation with Matthias Heseros. Neil, in a recent review in Times Literary Supplement, the economist Joseph Stiglitz wrote, by now it is clear that something is fundamentally wrong with modern capitalism. The 2008 global financial crisis showed that the system as currently constructed is neither efficient nor stable. What's your opinion? Well, what else is new? Capitalism has never been crisis-free, and it's not supposed to be crisis-free. Uh, if you go back to Joseph Schumpeter, uh, when he wrote Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy back in the well, late 1930s, early 1940s, one of the best ideas that he came up with was that capitalism was partly about creative destruction. Uh, in other words, capitalism's ability to scrap things uh, is inseparable from its ability to invent new things. So I think when critics, uh, and this goes all the way back to Karl Marx, say it's terrible capitalism produces crises, they're failing to see that crises are inherent in the way that capitalism works and not likely to culminate, as Marx thought, in some massive crisis that would render the system obsolete. 2008 was a big financial crisis, no question, but it wasn't as big a disaster as the 1929 slump and the subsequent depression. Uh, why? The answer is that we've learned from the experience of the last 100 years how better to cope with financial crises. And what are those lessons? Well, there are a number. If you look back on the late 20s and early 1930s, the most obvious mistake that made the Depression enduring was monetary policy. As Milton Friedman showed many years ago now in his famous Monetary History of the United States, co-authored with Anna Schwartz, the Fed made uh, every mistake it could have made it worsened the crisis arising from the stock market slump of 1929, uh, for example, by raising rates, allowing banks to fail. Uh, so lesson number one was that monetary policy needs to be very accommodative in the face uh, of a financial crisis. And credit must be given to Ben Bernanke and other central bankers uh, for the way in which they responded to the crisis. I'm not saying they're blameless because in many ways you could say that they'd made the crisis more likely with the monetary policy of the pre-2008 period, mm. but we'll leave that aside. Then there was the fiscal policy. During the Depression, governments felt they should try to balance their budgets. In our crisis, most governments uh, accepted that a consequence of a big shock was that deficits would increase and government would make up uh, for the shortfall in private sector demand. Uh, and thirdly, there was a complete breakdown of international cooperation during the Great Depression. Whereas during the financial crisis, international cooperation between the central banks in particular went quite well. So when one looks back on the period from 2008 uh, to uh, 2018, the striking thing is that we didn't have a Great Depression. Many people predicted that mm. we would, uh, but we didn't actually from the vantage point of the ordinary investor yeah. uh, in the United States, there was really just one bad year. Uh, if you had a standard portfolio of, say, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, yeah. you did fine every year except 2008 during that entire 10-year period. If that's a crisis of capitalism, then I guess I'm Karl Marx. But it doesn't look like a crisis of capitalism to me. That's not to say the system's perfect. That's not to say we can't make improvements. But I really don't like it when economists say the system is completely broken. It's fundamentally flawed. The 
language that Joseph Stiglitz and others have used. Because that, I think, encourages people on the left to think, aha, we can bring socialism yeah. back from the dead because there is, in fact, a fundamental crisis of capitalism. It's nonsense. The crisis is not so profound. And the reforms that we can make to capitalism uh, are very different indeed from the sorts of thing that socialists would like to do. I mean, if you just look at development, of course, from the 19th century up until today, by any measure, cat capitalism, with all its ill, still has delivered an historically unprecedented prosperity globally. Still, individuals might get really hurt in this. So, so, so how do we take that, that into account? What, 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 can the state, for example, help here? Can they um, uh, make the boom and bust cycle less, less vile? Well, all along, the argument has been that uh, the state plays a role in capitalism. Adam Smith yeah. didn't suggest that there should be no state. Uh, his point was uh, simply that the state should not too much interfere with the working of the free market. What the state provides in a well-ordered society is the rule of law, security, so that there is fundamental security of property uh, from crime and from foreign invaders and therefore also defence. And the state, and this again is an argument that goes back a very long way, should also provide uh, certain public goods that the market won't necessarily do well at providing. Uh, education, some elements of healthcare, and of course some provision for those people who, through no fault of their own, can't uh, look after themselves. Mm. So I don't think there's ever really a serious debate to be had about whether we need the state. Of course we do. The question is, how much should the state interfere with the market process? The socialist position has long been, all the way back to the 19th century, yeah. that it's not good for the capital of the economy to be controlled by private interests, that in fact the state should control the commanding heights uh, of the economy. And the socialist vision was that you simply couldn't leave the iron works yeah. uh, or the banks or any of the major industries in private hands. You had to bring them into public control. We ran that experiment mm. in numerous countries, especially in the 20th century, and it was always a disaster. Uh, sometimes an absolutely catastrophic disaster costing millions of lives in the case of the Soviet Union yeah. and Mao's China. Uh, it ought to be a very clear takeaway of the 20th century that the states controlling the economy, the states controlling the means of production, is a bad idea. Not only does it lead to suboptimal allocation of capital, it also tends to lead uh, to corruption. And because expropriation violates the fundamental principle of private property, it undermines the rule of law itself. We ought to have learned that lesson. The correct lesson of the 20th century was that you needed a state that was capable of, of coping with the shocks that are inherent in the capitalist mm -hmm. system. And as I just mentioned, we, we learned that central banks and finance ministries can do a lot to offset financial shocks. We've got better at that. And one consequence of that, Matthias, is that the social costs of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, globally were far less yeah. than the costs of the 1930s. So I think we need to recognize that in terms of the, the balance between the free market and a state that supports it, uh, the model actually stood quite well uh, the test of the financial crisis. Of course, we can improve on it. It's worth having a debate about what can be improved. But let's stop arguing that there was a fundamental crisis of capitalism, the whole thing needs to be scrapped. But what I find interesting here is that in many ways, what you're describing goes against an argument you can find still today by contemporary historians that you actually can't learn, or at least we don't learn, uh, from history. But here's an example that people actually have. Um, uh, and why is that found in this particular sector, uh, do you think? Well, the idea that we can't really learn from history or we can only learn how to make new mistakes was a quite fashionable one amongst academic historians back when I was an undergraduate in the 1980s. I can remember being told almost as soon as I arrived at Oxford that we shouldn't even 
bother to try to learn lessons from history. That was the sort of thing that journalists did. And I remember being slightly puzzled by that because the whole reason I'd signed up to study history was precisely to try and learn some lessons from it. And and actually, it's, it's a common sense view, but it's also one that's validated by earlier philosophers of history, like the great R.G. Collingwood, who I think rightly said, uh, writing in the late 1930s, that the whole point of studying the past is better to understand the present and the future by juxtaposing our situation with the situations of people in the past. Mm. Now, in practice, uh, when the financial crisis struck, the Federal Reserve uh, meeting in Washington to decide what to do Uh, could simply have looked at the macroeconomic models that the Fed staff has long operated. Mm. And indeed, uh, in the initial period after the failure of Lehman Brothers, they did that. And the staff economists said, uh, well, don't worry, this is a modest shock and there might be a slight slight loss of uh, momentum in the economy uh, going into 2009, but that recovery will quickly follow. Um, And the people sitting around the table, including the Fed chair, Ben Bernanke, scratched their heads listening to these forecasts and said, you know what, that doesn't sound quite right. Bernanke, as it happened, had studied the financial cost consequences of the Great Depression uh, as a young academic. And what I find fascinating as I look at the transcripts of the Federal Open Markets Committee, the key decision-making body of the Federal Reserve, was that they gradually moved away from the economic model and they started to talk about history. What was this crisis like? Was it like the crisis that Sweden had in the early 90s? Was it like the crisis that Japan had had? Or was it actually worse? And there's this extraordinary moment in round about October when Bernanke himself alludes to the Great Depression, and you realise they're waking up to the possibility that this could be as bad as 1929. That's applied history happening right there. Policymakers realising that the model doesn't really help them, that it's actually making wrong predictions, turn reflexively, without any discussion, to historical analogies. And they have a conversation about what this is like And they arrive at the correct conclusion, not a majority of them, but the key decision makers, that this is very like 1929. And therefore, they have to do everything they can to offset the shock. And I think that was a very, very important illustration of the importance of applied history for economists. But I wonder, so should any applied history, is 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 it best applied in the emergency? That, you know, you... you, you, um, uh, uh, when it all happens and you need to, to learn the lessons. Or can we, you know, can we just do as doctors want us to do? Um, just try to be more healthy, to, to prevent these things um, in advance. It just still seems like historians seem to be just as bad as anyone else in predicting things. Well, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I agree with you that preventative applied history is better than emergency applied history. And you can see bad emergency applied history, if you look a little further back, Mm. to the way the US government responded to the 9-11 attacks. Very interestingly, when you look at the discussions that happened just after that, a lot of bad analogies started to be Can you give an example of that? Around. Well, the speed with which the conversation turned to Saddam Hussein mm. uh, and the question of what could be done with Iraq in the aftermath of 9-11 produced a whole range of bad analogies. He was Hitler. Uh, invading Iraq would be similar to liberating France uh, at the end of World War II. Terrible analogies. Or the president himself, George W. Bush, asking uh, at one point when things were going wrong in Iraq, you know, where's the Iraqi George Washington, as if they were somehow reenacting the American Revolution in Baghdad. Bad analogies, I think, led the United States to make a really grave policy error, uh, or perhaps a series of errors, uh, with respect uh, to Iraq. So I think bad analogies are extremely dangerous, and applied historians need to be there to say, stop, wait, that's not the right analogy, this really isn't 1938 in Europe or 1945 in Europe. But to come back to your question about preventative applied history, I think historians have a better shot at anticipating future crises than economists or political scientists. And I can illustrate that with the example of 2008. 
Between 2006 and 2008, I was writing a book called The Ascent of Money, the whole point of which was to say, we are likely to experience a large financial crisis in our time because we are making the following mistakes. Um, and so the book in many ways anticipated the crisis and all the journalism that I did in 2006, 2007 revolved around things like subprime mortgages, which at that time almost nobody had heard of, or the mistakes uh, in monetary policy that were being made, or the strange relationship between China and America, which I called Chimerica, which led to this strange flow of capital from China, a relatively poor country, to the United States, a very rich one. All of that was perfectly discernible ahead of the crisis. It wasn't as if the crisis was unpredictable. If you knew what you were looking for, and the point that I kept making at that time was, we've created an incredibly leveraged financial system, banks are woefully undercapitalized, a relatively small shock, and it doesn't really matter where it comes from, is going to cause a chain reaction through the system, and governments are not really well prepared for this. So I don't think it's difficult for historians to think about the future. No. In fact, they should be doing that because the kind of pattern recognition that we learn as historians equips us better to think about future scenarios than the kind of models that economists and political scientists build, which are really too mechanistic to capture historical reality. And what is also interesting, interesting of course, is that everyone who has to do forecasting tend to, do, to use historical examples and historical analogies. There's, there's really no way around it. Um, but one thing that's been striking in me does, is that socioeconomic factors have for a long time been favoured by both academics and politicians alike as the go-to explanation for anything from radicalisation uh, to populism. And I wonder how much explanatory power does the state of the economy have in explaining, for example, the polarisation of politics or the current culture wars online? Yeah, that's a good point. I think there is a tendency, maybe it's in built in our education system to go looking uh, for socioeconomic explanations for any phenomenon that you're puzzled by, whether it's uh, Islamic terrorism or right-wing populism. And, and I think that there's a reason why historians should uh, at least correct this tendency. Yes, economics is extraordinarily important. I'm, by training, a financial historian. I spent a lot of my early career thinking about why, for example, hyperinflation had devastated Germany in the early 1920s. But I wouldn't make the claim that you can explain the rise of Hitler simply in terms of monetary and fiscal policy. That would be absurd. You have to understand a bunch of other stuff. You have to understand the political institutions of the Weimar Republic and why they were weak. You have to understand the, the German culture that produced the revulsion against uh, democracy, that allowed anti-Semitism to fester even in a society where Jews are really very highly assimilated by the 1920s. And the point about history is this. If it's well done, it's economic history and political history and cultural and social history and also international history all at once. I don't think you can understand a phenomenon like, say, populism today just by looking at the impact of the financial crisis on the incomes of working class households. I mean, you can do that and you can say, well, here's the evidence. Uh, people suffered an economic shock after 2008 and therefore they voted for Trump. But it's actually not a sufficient explanation. A lot of the people who were worse off as a result of the financial crisis voted for Hillary Clinton. A lot of people who'd done perfectly well in the period after 2008 voted for Donald Trump. And I would say as a rule of thumb, if you're trying to explain what happened in 2016, only about half of it is going to be explicable in economic terms. The other half has to, I think, be explained in terms of, of culture, attitudes, a revulsion against the multiculturalism that the liberal elites had been touting, a reaction against immigration that wasn't just to do with the economic impact uh, of migration, a bunch of variables that aren't captured by a standard uh, analysis of the economics uh, of, the, of the period after the financial crisis. When do you think this all started? If you try to, if you try to create a timeline here, when you see both populism, also this, uh, you know, the culture wars that we see today as well, which is uh, everyone is talking about now, but it's probably been around for longer. 
Um, in, in, your, in your view, where, where, where's the turning point? Well, like a good example of uh, how to think historically is, is not to start by assuming that this can be explained in terms of real wages. Let's ask the question, what has changed most dramatically in the world in the last, let's say, 20 years? And I think the answer to that would have to be the advent of the internet, because there's been a structural change in the public sphere of, of an absolutely massive scale, uh, which I think we still tend to underestimate because we don't appreciate how very different uh, the media have become relative to the media of our childhoods. Certainly for baby boomer types like me, born 1964, it looks kind of similar. There are still TVs after all, even if they're much bigger than they were when I was a kid. Uh, but I'm, I think, inclined to underestimate how far the population all around the world is now getting its information uh, from smartphones uh, through the network platforms like Google and, and Facebook, rather than in the, in the way that I got information back when I was a kid. So I think you can't begin to understand what has happened in democratic politics until you see that the structural change in the public sphere is as big as the impact of the printing press when it was introduced into Europe in the 15th century. And the introduction of the printing press revolutionized uh, religious life and political life in Europe. I think in just the same way, the internet, the personal computer, and the smartphone have revolutionized political life uh, all around the world. That's really the key to understanding the populist wave far more, I think, than the financial crisis. After all, the populist wave took a long time to come after the financial crisis. Uh, it, there's quite a gap between the 2008 shock and the 2016 election results. And you have to ask the question, why was it in that period that established political parties began to lose control of electorates? And why was it suddenly possible for Donald Trump, who had tried his hand at politics before, to become a breakthrough candidate? I think the answer is that the internet had reached critical mass, and in particular, the network platforms had reached a critical mass, so that they were, for the first time, the principal source of information. Remember, by 2016, something like 80% of Americans were getting their news via the network platforms, yes. either from Google or Facebook or some other social network. That was a really big change. That hadn't been true in 2008. It wasn't really particularly true in 2012. So a big change had happened in the structure of, of communications. And that seems to me where you need to begin looking if you want to understand what's new about politics today. That's the central theme of my book, The Square and the Tower. Is, is, is the internet also um, the explanation for why socialism is on vogue among young people? And there seems to be a true generational gap here. A different way of looking at politics if you're sort of under 30. And, uh, uh, but, but I want to, it, it's, it's in a sense quite new. Uh, it's a, it's a diff, it seems to be a different type of socialism. Certainly the people who are articulating the, the new socialism, uh, from Bernie Sanders to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the United States, make very effective use of social media with millions of followers uh, on, on Facebook and, and Twitter. So I, I think that's certainly a part of the story. But I think it's only really the left catching up with what the right had first got uh, right in the 2016 election. To understand why younger voters, and particularly in their early 20s, are attracted to socialism, I think you need to look elsewhere. Uh, those of us of a certain age, and I am now 55, remember the Cold War, and we remember what socialism was like. Socialism in the sense of systems where the means of production were controlled by the government. We know how that ended, we know how it impoverished Eastern Europe, we know how it impoverished the Soviet Union, and therefore we have a kind of resistance to socialism. We spent our early uh, careers, I certainly did, arguing against socialism, whether from the point of view of Cold War foreign policy or the point of view of domestic economic policy. That was how I cut my teeth uh, in the 1980s as a young uh, historian and, and journalist. But if you were born so recently that none of this touched your life, uh, if you are 
between the ages of, let's say, 18 and 23, you belong to Generation Z, as the Americans like to call it, then this is as, as familiar to you as, oh, I don't know, World War II uh, was to me. Now, I knew about World War II as a kid, even though I'd been born in 1964, because it was on television on a very regular basis. Um, you don't see too many things on television or even on YouTube about the evils of socialism. You certainly don't hear anything about that if you go to a major university. Uh, you will look in vain for courses on the realities of socialism in the 20th century. Mm. You will find very few courses at the Ivy League uh, on the subject of how the Soviet Union treated its people. So I think there's actually been an educational failure Whereas my generation was taught a lot about uh, the evils of totalitarianism. Mm. Uh, that's really what I studied as an undergraduate. And as a graduate, I was looking uh, a lot at what had happened in Germany, in the Soviet Union. The present generation does not study that kind of thing at university and has very little opportunity to do so. So I think the revival of socialism is an educational failure. And it's not surprising, actually, that universities that are broadly left-leaning, given the complexion of faculties and administrators, don't spend much time, don't feel any obligation, in fact, to teach students about the realities of socialism and history. The result is that there's a complete confusion about what socialism is. Young Americans, when you ask them, well, what do you mean by socialism, say, well, Sweden. Uh, now, if Sweden's a, Not particularly socialist. a socialist country, it's going to be news to most Swedes. Uh, sure, Sweden has a more generous welfare state than the United States, but it's a free market economy by any measure. Absolutely. And if you ask, say, the Heritage Foundation, which is a distinctly right-wing American think tank, how does Sweden rank as a free market? Uh, actually, the answer is it, it ranks very close to the top of the international league table. So I think there's a complete confusion amongst many young Americans about what socialism actually means. You mentioned... Uh... Joseph Schumpeter, who's in 1942, actually doubted that capitalism would survive. Will the capitalist system, as we know it, still be around in 2050? Oh, yes, absolutely, because all the alternatives uh, fail. Uh, this is a bit like what Winston Churchill said about democracy, that it was the worst of all possible political systems, except uh, for all the ones that have been other ones that have been tried. And I feel the same way about capitalism. It's the worst of all economic systems, apart from all the other systems that we've tried. Uh, let's take the obvious competitor, China. Now, China's clearly not a, a true free market economy. Uh, social uh, state-owned enterprises uh, control at least a third of uh, the economy, and their importance has been growing under Xi Jinping, who in many ways is a kind of throwback figure who keeps reasserting the importance of socialism uh, to the Chinese system. Uh, China's uh, political model is an authoritarian, even totalitarian model, making full use of the technology that the private sector has either uh, generated or stolen from the West to put its citizens under a kind of surveillance that even George Orwell didn't imagine uh, could be possible when he wrote 1984. Now, if the Chinese are able to overtake the United States economically with a system that doesn't have the rule of law, doesn't have representative government, doesn't have meaningful property rights, and retains substantial state control over the economy, then we will have a problem. But I'm very doubtful that that will happen. And I think we'll be looking back uh, in 2050, if we're still around, saying how funny it was that so few people anticipated the crisis of the People's Republic of China when they'd seen so many such crises before. And wasn't it obvious that a one-party state would never be able to maintain power over a fifth of humanity after it had created the biggest middle class in history by letting the free market system operate on the fringes uh, of the state-controlled economy? I think the crisis of the PRC is coming much faster than most people realize. It's not going to be a financial crisis like 2008. I think it'll be a crisis of political legitimacy. And who knows, maybe we're beginning to see the beginnings of that crisis in the streets of Hong Kong as we, as we sit here uh, discussing uh, these issues. Neil Ferguson, thank you very much. My pleasure.